Peter Blanchett. I live in Northampton, Massachusetts, and uh, I invented this instrument, the arch guitar, uh, back in 1980, together with a guy named Walter Stanel, an instrument maker in Boston, Massachusetts. Basically, when I had the arch guitar made, I wanted an instrument that made it easier for me to play the music of Bach. And a lot of Bach's music uh, is, is similar to Baroque lute music. And Baroque lutes have more strings than guitars. They have a wider range of notes. They start up higher and their bass notes go down lower. Uh, I thought maybe that I wanted to play an actual historic lute, but I tried that for a while and found that uh, having played the guitar since I was really young, I didn't really want to change that much. I really just wanted to play a guitar with, with more strings and so with a bigger range. And so the arch guitar starts tuned up at, well, right, right now it's a, that's a G sharp. So uh, it's usually tuned first string open to G, and, uh, but we'll, we'll call it G. And then it goes down to D, A, F, C, G, D. Then it goes up to F, down to C, down to B flat, and down to A. And that sounds like a really crazy tuning, but it's really not. It's really the way, it's very similar to the way a Renaissance lute, late Renaissance lute was tuned. If I play a chord like this on, on my arch guitar, on the first six strings, kind of looks like an kind of looks like an E chord on a guitar. Um, and it's actually a G on this instrument. So it transposes. And, um, and the Renaissance lute, uh, you know, was around for hundreds of years, tuned the first seven strings of my instrument uh, were, are tuned the same way a Renaissance lute was tuned. So it's very easy for me to play music like John Dowland or the first piece I played was um, by Pierre Attagnant. That's, a, you know, lute music from around early, like 1511, let's say. Uh, Dowland is about, you know, 100 years later, but uh, so you have this. So that's my seventh string down there. When I was a teenager and had a Les Paul, my whole life was all about music already, but it was about playing um, blues and rock and roll and writing my own music in a band. And I went and I heard this great English guitarist named Julian Bream. I'd never heard him play before, but a girlfriend invited me to go hear him in a concert and said, this guy's supposed to be the greatest guitarist in the world. And I thought, you know, I was 16 years old. I, I've never even heard of him, man. You know, how, wow. So I went and heard him and he came out in the first half of the concert, he played the lute, a real lute. Um, and first of all, I mean, like I say, it really was like a religious experience. I was so blown away and I sat, I was very lucky. We had really good seats, like two rows back. And I sat and I'm looking up at him and uh, listening to him play. And then he came out after the uh, intermission and he played 20th century music by Benjamin Britten and uh, Hector Villalobos. And it was, Unbelievable. I mean, it was, it literally changed my life overnight.
Boston Conservatory after I discovered I loved classical music. Uh, because I came from a very working class background, I, I worked at Parker Brothers Games in Salem, Massachusetts, making Monopoly boards. So for eight hours a day, to save up money to go to Boston Conservatory, which my parents said, you can go, but we don't have the money to send you, but if you can you know, get the money and you can do it. They, they, they didn't think I shouldn't do it, but they probably wished I did something else. So I worked at Parker Brothers Games, folding Monopoly boards, 12 at a time and stacking them for eight hours a day. And uh, I went into Boston when I would get off work with my girlfriend and we would walk around Boston. We would go to movies, coffee houses, whatever. And uh, I saw this guy playing the cello in front of the Harvard Coupe. And I, I stood there and watched him playing. And while I watched him playing, he was playing Bach. He was pretty good. And remember, this is when I really, really fell in love with this kind of music. It's all I wanted to do. I would have much rather have been doing that than folding Monopoly boards in stacks of 12 and stacking them on pallets for eight hours a day. Much rather. So I watched this guy playing his cello and I looked at his case and I counted the money that people put in it. And it was like, I'm standing there, I'm looking at my watch. It's got like $1.25 during that last, for that last piece. Another piece, 75 cents. Another piece, $2 and maybe 30 cents, I think. I couldn't tell for sure. Well, I made $3 an hour working at Parker Brothers Games in Salem, Massachusetts. And that was a really good gig at the time. So I saw this guy and I, I'm thinking, he's making like 10 bucks an hour. And I'm making three bucks an hour folding Monopoly boards. I'm, I'm gonna quit my job and do this tomorrow. And I quit my job which my parents thought was not cool. And I went out and I got a little amplifier and I stuck a terrible sounding pickup on my guitar because they were terrible back then. And I was in front of the Harvard Coop the next night. And I played. And I made the same amount of money in a couple hours playing in front of the Coop as I did at a whole day at that horrific job. And when that happened, I had this like, I made this deal with myself. I said, as long as I can make the same amount of money making music as I would pushing a broom, I'm going to make music. I'm never going to stop if, because there's no excuse. I had a lot of fun playing that night too. Uh, I, was, I had people stop and say, hey kid, nice, you sound good. And uh, maybe once in a while someone would stop and this would be 1978, I think. And someone, you know, back then a quarter was quite good. Someone put a buck in my case. That's like someone putting like five bucks in your case now or 10 bucks, I don't know. And um, that made me really think uh, people really like this music. Mm -hmm.